let me start with a few questions. Um, Gene, what are some of the uh, tips and tricks that you have consistently used um, to have a successful uh, interclude uh, device procedure, specifically related to the interclude device? First of all, I'm going to say thank you for the wonderful presentation. And it's fun to see such wonderfully integrated, different little techniques. Uh, I don't know if everybody watching it can appreciate all the little subtleties of what you showed us in that video. It was quite, quite rich. So for myself and my experience with the Interclude device, I, I have a good plan. I learned that from Doug. You have to have that CTA in advance. Uh, and it gives you a whole bunch of information where you're not going to get in trouble, where you, how you're going to be successful. Uh, I would say eight, nine percent of the time I see something on the uh, on a pre-op CTA that makes me change the technique a little bit, either in terms of monitoring, access side, or 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 whatnot. Uh, that having been said, I'm not a fan of fluoro in the OR. Uh, we did that in '96 when the Interclude device was first released, and we sort of fell off that. And I feel pretty comfortable uh, using. Uh, echocardi echocardiography for positioning. I think for success, it's like sailing the boat. That's what it's like to me. You come in, you aim high. I don't decrease the pressure in the aorta. I touch with the robotic arm, touch the surface of the heart with the fibrillator wire on, real easy. Fibrillate the heart, inflate the balloon starting high. You see the root pressure go down. The balloon sucks down a little bit. You sort of trim in the sheet to keep it from going down too far. I'm watching in one eye with the echo, the other eye I'm watching the green balloon move, and I'm sort of integrating those two things. And then once I'm happy that I have good position, then I'm gonna turn on the cardioplegia and uh, be sure that my systemic pressure is greater than my root pressure, so I'm not gonna kick it backwards. I think I've done, we do one other thing, which is a little bit different. Uh, if you're going to fibrillate the heart, you're going to want to vent it sooner rather than later. So before fibrillating the heart, we'll pre-dissect the groove between the left atrium and the right atrium. So then once we're happy, we just take the scissors open and make a schnitt and, now, and, and put the ball tip sucker in, and now the heart's decompressed. So I, I, I think that that's, that's, that's about the majority, and that's my philosophy going into it. Well, I think those are great comments, Gene. And you know, one thing I've learned uh, in my career is there's a lot of different ways to do these procedures and uh, different uh, techniques work for different surgeons for different environments. And um, uh, what matters is, you know, obviously the ultimate outcome. And uh, those, are, those are great comments. Uh, Doug, my, my next question is for you. Um, you're sort of the best person to answer this, I think, because you taught basically everyone on this panel how to do this. But one of the concerns that neophytes to the interclude device have is balloon migration during the procedure. And I think in the past, uh, prior to some refinements, the, the balloon was more likely to migrate than it is today. But um, what, what sort of uh, tips and tricks would you have regarding proper seating of the balloon and preventing a balloon migration either into the arch or into the root uh, during the procedure? Well, I mean, the... the... The migration, the proximal and distal are pretty different animals. Um, first of all, let me say, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was, uh, you, you, you've kind of done the ultimate now where you don't really need the assistant at all. So as I've told you uh, recently, Dr. Chitwood would, would be very proud of that concept. Uh, on migration of the balloon, um, I think, one of the key things that you demonstrated that you have to have is you got to have the room set up so you at any one time can get all the information, right and left arms, echo, uh, the fluoroscopic uh, camera, the, the, um, for fluorescein, uh, I see green dye. What an incredible advance that was. Um, the biggest problem that I've seen with new surgeons is on proximal migration is a failure to pull back the balloon with enough tension. Uh, if you blow the balloon up, you occlude the aorta, but you leave slack in the catheter as it passes up from the femoral through the aorta, 
when you turn your back, the pressure at the, when you've stopped giving cardioplegia, the pressure on the systemic side will push the balloon towards the aortic valve. I think that's the most common cause of proximal migration. Um, distal migration, where you pull it in, where the balloon moves in front of the innominate artery, that can occur on inflation by withdrawing too much, or it can occur anytime the aortic root is pressurized excessively and pushes the balloon uh, distally against the systemic pressure. So sometimes it's because systemic pressure is too low and you're giving anti-grade cardioplegia, or you're testing excessively, you're pressurizing the left ventricle, um, and you raise the root pressure greater than systemic, you'll push the balloon distally. Um, I guess I should say interclude device distally. But the, the, the thing that I would say that I kind of agree with what Gene was getting at is you, if you want to learn how to use the interclude device, you have to go study a team that is using it successfully because there's, there's nuances everywhere. But what you really want to do is find a team that uses it study the way they insert it, monitor it, inflate it, and so forth, and, and, and police it during the case. Memorize how they do that and take it back to your institution. Those are great comments, Doug. And I, I'll, quote, I'll quote you a famous statement that you made one time that if, if, you, if you were to tell me that you had to take away uh, either the uh, interclude device or the robot, I would keep the interclude device. That's how important it is uh, to the operations that we do. But it's it's also, uh, it's not uh, mystical, it's a science and uh, nobody has uh, broken it down better about how to use that. But really, if you visit anybody here on, on this faculty and others out there that have had experience with it, you can learn it. But but you really have to learn it from another surgeon who's who's doing it every day and knows the nuances of it. Uh, Clifton, uh, it's great to see you here. Um, I'd like to ask you the next question, and that is, do you have any um, guidance uh, for folks on uh, the nuances of port placement, how to get um, good port placement, and you know, uh, what are some of the pitfalls there? The way we look at it is trying to visualize the uh, ports and the operation in 3D. If you think about it, really, you're coning down, you're, you're creating a cone, and, and the cone tip is at the mitral valve. And so we like to spread our arms out as wide as we can on the chest wall so that uh, they don't inter they interfere less, and then they meet right at the mitral valve. And then the, we don't have as much problem, we, we move a little smoother. The other important thing is to start, I think, in the fourth intercostal space. If you're going to miss, I'd miss high and not miss low because working up is always harder than working down. And we try and stay as far lateral as we can. The, 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 the more anterior you get, which you have to do in a, in a non-robotic, minimally invasive operation, really does not facilitate visualization of the mitral valve. So uh, our ports tend, the video port is in the uh, fourth intercostal face right at the anterior axillary line. We still use a, a, a generous working port, and it's about two centimeters, and it's a, about two centimeters lateral to that. We skip two inner spaces for both the left and the right arm. So the left is in the second, and the right is in the sixth. The left is a little anterior to the right, just because uh, the, you can minimize shoulder interference. And then uh, we've moved the uh, retractor port uh, really a little more anterior probably than most people. It's in the fifth intercostal space, and it's just maybe two centimeters to, to the side of the uh, mammary artery. And, and that spreads out the arms and spreads out the, the uh, ports as much as we can. And I think that really makes the operation easier and it opens up uh, the, the space for uh, your uh, table side surgeon. Yeah, I was going to say, Clifton, that's one of the specific uh, tricks that I learned from you when I visited was moving that atrial retractor port um, uh, farther away from the right arm to avoid collisions. And that's been that's been great, although collisions are less with the more recent version of the robot. You know, one of the questions that folks may have is why, in this case, uh, we chose the PhysioFlex uh, aneuploplasty ring. I think it has a number of unique features. Um, for one, 
the nitinol um, makes a big difference because it's not going to deform as I'm putting it through the working port. Uh, obviously, if I'm using a flexible band, that's not an issue. Uh, but but it is very important if I'm using a semi-rigid uh, band, as in this case. The second thing I like about it is that it's dynamic. It moves with the cardiac cycle and takes advantage of the systolic and diastolic motion of the aorta and the annulus to favor coaptation. Um, and the third thing is it's got that little extension up to the right trigone, which is a common area of dehiscence. And I think our friend Dr. Adams came up with that idea, and it's a good one. Um, because a solid stitch there will will help prevent uh, uh, prevent uh, dehiscence. Now, my next question uh, is for you, Jane. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, based on your experience, which complications have you been able to either reduce or mitigate uh, using the interclude device as opposed to a transthoracic uh, cross clamp? Well, I think the primary thing that the Intraclude device helps us avoid is postoperative bleeding. And for me, if I don't have an Intraclude device, then I'm going to be using a clamp and a needle in the ascending aorta. And uh, that's associated with uh, bleeding. It's also associated with dissection, too. If remember uh, Dr. Cohn's original series of minimally invasive aortic valves, uh, they had they had a dissection in that series, and the dissection was in the control arm, the sternotomy from a cardioplegia needle. So uh, needling the ascending aorta is is potentially also with a larger size, thinner aorta, is not a freebie. So that's one of the things I know I can avoid. Additionally, in a reop situation. I'm not gonna be have to digging out the aorta and making bleeding. I don't have to worry about any of that. All I have to do is get the intraclude device in, see the aorta light up green and, and uh, deliver my cardioplegia and go to work. And of course, there's a big difference in an endoscopic environment with a hole in aorta bleeding and an open sternotomy. You know, it's-, uh, it's uh, I, think the, I think one feels a lot different when doing that, a lot, lot different. Great, thank you, Gene. Uh, Doug, I know you're very passionate about the um, interclude uh, device. Uh, what what would you say about uh, what are the advantages of that uh, device over uh, either transthoracic cross clamp or old fashioned sternotomy surgery? Well, I think there's several advantages. One is uh, this is just my personal experience, but I think that a a um, interclude balloon inflating on the inside of the aorta. Is the, is the least traumatic way to occlude the aorta. So we've used it in a lot of people with significant atherosclerosis. Uh, we're not perfusing them femorally, we're perfusing them from the central aorta or axillary, but I think it is the most benign way to occlude the aorta. Uh, I also think that it has numerous features. Obviously, I agree with Gene, a hole in the aorta, is, it's, uh, it's, it's like bomb squad work. That's how I... That's how I view closing that hole at the end of the case. Uh, but also the balloon allows you to uh, vent the aorta and to uh, test the valve very effectively. For example, we, we monitor the pressure in the root, we raise the systemic pressure, and then we inflate the left uh, ventricle with saline. And so our rule is that we like to see the aortic root pressure climb to 90, and then that gives us a really good test of the valve. And that reduces the surprises that you sometimes get with mitral valve repairs when you come off bypass even because you haven't tested it sufficiently. So, you know, that, the, those are just some of the main uh, advantages. Uh, and I, I certainly also agree with Gene. We went through a period when we used a clamp uh, uh, using a um, transthoracic clamp through a separate stab wound. and there's no question that the left arm is close to it. You're, you're oftentimes disturbing that clamp with your left arm and that's disconcerting. And that may be how uh, there have been uh, some dissections reported with the transthoracic clamp. I just wanna make a couple of comments about aortic dissection. Uh, the idea that um, aortic dissection has something to do with the intraclude device uh, alone is, is preposterous. Uh, I, in my career, not personally, but in among colleagues, have seen more aortic dissections in full sternotomy cases 
cumulatively than in minimally invasive cases, although we know nationally the, um, the data would suggest a slightly higher incidence with femoral cannulation. It generally is due to femoral cannulation, but it can absolutely occur with a transthoracic cross clamp, et cetera. And I think that if you're, if you're very precise about cannulation, um, you will get excellent results. It's not something to be taken um, casually. Uh, I never let anyone else do it. I never let a trainee cannulate or um, arrest the heart with the uh, interclude device because it does need to be done well. But uh, the uh, people watching this are, are good surgeons. And if you put as much attention to detail in cannulation and placement of the interclude device, you will have good results. Uh, in fact, one of my mentors showed me a paper one time where sternotomy and cannulation of the aorta, ascending aorta, was controversial. I think that came out of NYU, Gene, if I'm uh, correct. Um, that was controversial at, at one point. In any case, uh, Clifton, I'd like to hear from you uh, how you think the interclude device uh, has impacted your practice, uh, not just uh, robotics, but cardiac surgery in general. How has this been beneficial to you and your patients in your practice? You know, in, in my experience, it has really simplified a robotic operation. Uh, I would echo everything that uh, Gene and uh, Doug said about the uh, the transthoracic uh, clamp. It clutters your field. My PA wants to leave every time because it hits him in his belly. I think there's a risk for injury not only the aorta but the pulmonary artery. Uh, you know, we clip the appendage through the uh, transverse sinus and it gets in the way of that. Um, so. The, it, clearing your field and simplifying an operation has always been something that's of interest to me. It was the way I was taught in, uh, by Dr. Cooley. Um, he might roll over in his grave if he knew I was doing this robot, but we do a simple robot and the interclude uh, allows you to simplify it. You, do, you clamp, you debent, you deliver your cardioplegia with one, uh, one thing. And, and um, it, it, in addition to that, um, I, I think that um, you can use it in areas outside of a, a robotic application um, where clamping the uh, aorta uh, is uh, or in, uh, uh, with a traditional clamp and where you have to dissect it out can be problematic. A perfect example is uh, existing aortic grafts. We've done that more than once. Um, so I, I think it can can benefit uh, you in terms, really primarily in terms of simplifying what is inherently a complex endeavor. I'm embarrassed that none of us really said until Cliff right now that for a reop, it's it's a sine qua non. I mean, who wants to be dissecting out an aorta with live graphs and everything when all I can do is you know have a plan come up from below with an interclude device and uh, put the heart asleep and get on and get my mitral valve done. Yeah, that's a great point, Gene. And, and those are good comments, Clifton. You know, I think uh, philosophically, uh, this is a time of um, great change in our specialty. And um, surgeons really have a new emphasis to innovate. And although uh, many of these things have been around for a while, uh, not everyone has adopted them. I think you've got a new generation of surgeons who were brought up from an early age, uh, realizing the value of minimally invasive endoscopic techniques. Uh, one of the first operations I ever scrubbed in on was an open gallbladder. And one of the last was an endoscopic uh, you know, cholecystectomy. So uh, in addition to that, many of us were well-trained and experienced in endovascular techniques and we're as comfortable with wires and catheters are, as we are a sternotomy saw. Uh, and so I think that there's really an opportunity for this platform to be uh, reborn, if you will, into a new era of cardiac surgery where we can start to really make cardiac surgery much more minimally invasively, minimally invasive. Um, in any case, uh, look for closing comments from uh, from you, uh, Gene. Uh, any? Uh, I, I think I'm just going. I'm, I'm just going to amplify on what you last said. It's the technology perhaps came out a little too soon, using it in the in the mid 1990s, uh, before we learned that hey, using this kind of equipment, we're going to stratify our patients. Doug taught us that. We look, we evaluate them, we know where the technology is going to be successful, where the trouble points might be, and how to avoid them. 
It's all about properly learning the technology. Fantastic. Doug, any uh, final comments for our audience? Well, I think an important concept talking about robotics and the interclude is should they be uh, learned simultaneously versus learning one uh, with handheld instruments, learning the interclude, or learning robotics through a mini Thor Academy and a clamp. And I think the two technologies are synergistic and they, they, they uh, make each of, of the independent ones easier. So uh, a balloon uh, unclutters the robotic field. The, ro the robot allows visualization of the aorta with the IC green balloon and uh, the two are synergistic. So I, I really think if some an institution is serious about learning endoscopic robotics, that they should learn the interclude uh, device um, application uh, simultaneously. Dr. Lewis, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm really more to um, echo what uh, Gene and uh, Doug have said. I, I think, Doug, in the past, it was reasonable to separate those learning curves, but it is no longer uh, a good idea. Um, I, and, and primarily because, again, coming back to the idea of simplicity, I, I think that all heart surgery is complex, but you can make it more complex or less complex. And what the technology uh, allows us to do and should be evolving to is more and more simplicity when it comes to doing any of these minimally invasive operations. And I think that's what the interclude device does is it, is it, is it makes it doable. It used, remember there was a comment, uh, one of the guys out of Texas Art said that Dr. Cooley used to hate cardioplegia because cardioplegia made uh, heart surgery possible for the average heart surgeon. <laughs> well, that's one of the, the things about the interclude device. It, it will make a robotic operation more possible for somebody that may not be uh, quite as adept as he otherwise would have been. I mean, I, I really think it simplifies things and it, it's a great enabling technology. Wonderful. Well, um, I'd like to thank our panelists as well as uh, the AATS and Edwards Life Sciences for uh, putting on an excellent master class. I enjoyed a lot, uh, enjoyed it a great deal and, and learned a lot. And uh, Gene, uh, Doug and Clifton, thanks so much for participating and and watching my case and, and discussing it. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.